It's great to be here in Phoenix and uh, really to see just uh, the diversity of the group in terms of age and in terms of experience. And there, there's just some great people that have been here for a long time. Amen. There's depth there. It was awesome to see the, the teens and the campus and to be a part of the West Coast School of Missions was very, very encouraging. And it's so great to see ministers that uh, are here now that we've known for today. So you guys have a great team, uh, Forrest and Mandy. Thank you. It was so great connecting with you guys last night. Let's go to God in prayer right now uh, just to set our hearts as we study the word. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for this chance to worship together, uh, to let our minds uh, drift and guide it and be guided toward you. Uh, we really pray that our, our hearts are spiritually focused right now. Uh, we pray that uh, you'll help us, God, to hear the message you want us to hear. Uh, help us to see the things you need us to see in our own lives, in the lives of our family, in the lives of our church. pray you'll bless this sermon right now. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. According to uh, Stephen M. R. Covey, this is the younger Covey, there is one thing that is common to every individual, every relationship, every team, every family, every organization, every nation, every economy. And one thing that's common and, and that ties every civilization throughout the world together, one thing which if you remove it, it will destroy the most powerful government. It will destroy the most successful business. It will destroy the most thriving economy. If you remove this one thing, your most influential leadership can be destroyed. The greatest friendships can be destroyed. The strongest character can be dissolved. And the deepest love can be broken down. On the other hand, if you develop this one thing and leverage it, this one thing has the potential to create unparalleled success and prosperity in every dimension of life. And yet it is the least understood, it's one of the most neglected and underestimated possibilities of our time. And this one thing, I have it on the screen, is trust. Trust is so important. You know, as a nation, as a fellowship of churches, as families, we need trust. Trust is crucial. We did a series on trust in our fellowship uh, in Los Angeles last year. We felt it was very, very important to talk about trust and build trust. Uh, unfortunately, oftentimes it gets broken down. Recently, my 12-year-old, uh, he has had a bout of um, not being honest. I got an email from his teacher. Uh, she said that he skipped class and in the process of skipping class, um, he was telling more than white lies. He was coming up with reasons why he, from the nurse, he couldn't get back to the room because he didn't feel great. But then his friend grabbed his backpack out of the class and so then he figured he didn't need to go back. And bottom line is he, he was just not telling the truth. And then when we asked him about it, he, span, he spun the same web to us. Like, so what happened? You went from the nurse where? And, and so you're saying you skipped class. And his head goes down. You know, my wife's great at just getting right to the heart of it. She's like, so you're saying you're, you lied and you skipped class. And he's like, yes. <laughs> and that happens a lot, right? You're growing through life, but, but it hurts trust. Obviously his teacher's not gonna trust him. And unfortunately, he's had some challenges um, just being honest, as often young future teens or teens do, being honest, telling the truth, just getting to the heart of stuff. And it does hurt our trust. And I said, listen, Nathan, if there's one thing you got to have in our family is you got to know we're loyal and trustworthy and we tell each other the truth. I know I'm the heavy in your life. Like I bring, you know, you're, you're afraid to tell me stuff. And I know you want to do a lot of crazy stuff as 12 year olds would want to do at times. Watch things you maybe shouldn't watch. At times you shouldn't do it. But you got to be honest with me. If you're honest, everything else is going to work out. So we're working on that. In Jeremiah 17, 7, it says, Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. You see, trust enables great things to happen between you and God, but you and other people as well. Trust in God enables you to become trustworthy people, to have strong integrity, godly intent, and it unleashes a capability to bring powerful results. 
We need to have trust in our relationship with God, and we absolutely need to have trust within our own physical families, and we need to have trust within our marriages, we need to have trust within our households, and we need to have trust in our churches, amen? This is very important stuff. And so today I have one point. We did a series from the book, The Speed of Trust. Great book if you want to read it. Written by Stephen M. R. Covey. And one of the main points, and that's my one point I want you to get today. How do you build trust? The amazing thing about trust is some people think once it's broken down, it can't be rebuilt. But in fact, it can. And the point I want to make today, in order to build trust, you must talk straight. You must talk straight. What does it mean to talk straight? It's to tell the truth and leave the right impression. To be clear. Be willing to tell people the truth even when it hurts. And do not spin the situation, right? Do not glaze over the situation. And this is a skill and a gift. Many of us have it naturally. All of us can learn this gift. Some of us don't have it. Uh, it's sometimes it's very difficult and elusive to just get right to the heart and tell the hard truth no matter what people are going to think. It's difficult. I, for one, I like to live in the world of things that are very faithful, positive, and visionary. And I always like to put the, you know, glass is half full spin on situations. And, and that's, a good, that's a good faithful quality for an evangelist. I want to be, I'm an evangelist. I mean, I'm a promoter. I'm a recruiter. I'm like... You know, I can sell you, you know, uh, you know, a popsicle in Arizona, right? Of course, that would be good because it would cool you down. But I could sell it in Alaska as well because it, it's exciting, right? I, I can make it look exciting. But sometimes I can tend to maybe put a spin on it that maybe it isn't as authentic and full-rounded as it needs to be. My wife is great at talking straight. It's a gift of hers. You know who else had this gift? Jesus, right? Jesus is phenomenal at, at talking straight. And so he's able to build trust with all of us, right? He's able to build trust with people that take a look. And so I want to look at the examples of Jesus. And then we're going to talk about what that looks like in our life. And I'm going to share some examples from my own marriage. Uh, but this is not just a marriage se seminar. However, my deepest and most intimate and connected relationship is with Carrie. And so we battle all the time through how to keep that trust strong. It's crucial in relationships. And next to Jesus, she's my most significant and important relationship. I value it very highly. And early on in, in our relationship, uh, one of the things I learned is that honesty was very, very important to her. And that meant communicating clearly my schedule, what I was doing and holding to it. Or instead of over-promising and under-delivering, to under-promise and over-deliver on what I was going to be doing with my time. Right? Another thing I learned, it was a huge thing, was as uh, I tended to have a positive spin on things, so I would often, you know, stuff the feelings I had. If, if things weren't going well in my early days of our marriage or I felt like maybe her tone was a, a little bit disrespectful, I, in my mind, I'd be like, oh, she didn't mean it. She, that's not the case. And I would stuff it. Men, can you relate to this? Some women can relate to this too. We stuff those feelings. Like, ah, that kind of bothered me. But she's not normally like that and you stuff it. Well, I would stuff it for like weeks and weeks and weeks. And then the smallest thing would come up. And then I would just, just be a volcano, right? Blow up. Ah, how come you moved my spoon? Why did you dare tell me to put my fork in the sink? And she's like, I just hoping you'd put it in the sink. I mean, you left it on the table. And, and, we would, and, and what I realized is I was holding all this stuff in, and that didn't produce trust in her. And what we learned early on is if I would get honest about how I was feeling, she would trust more, and it helped, it helped her to grow in her ability to uh, take a look at her own self and, and her reactions to things. But ultimately, I had to be honest about where I was at in the moment. Husbands and wives, this is an important part. Relationships in general, you have to be, you have to be honest and talk straight in the moment. We're going to talk more about this. It really helped our marriage tremendously. Um, we've been married now for 28 years. And uh, more in love now than we've ever been. It's wonderful. I look forward to the next 28. So, uh, but trust is something we work on. Trust is crucial. And you got to talk straight. Jesus was the expert at this. Let's take a look at some of what he had to say. 
in Matthew chapter 5, and you read in the Sermon on the Mount a lot of this, and we're going to look at some, some text here. It says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. And in verse 20, he says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus wants people to be right with him, make it to heaven, and live there with him for eternity. But he tells the truth about what it's going to take. And this is a very challenging scripture. If you're living in that day and you heard him say, for I tell you that unless your righteousness, okay, the, the, uh, the guys that he's speaking to, you know, his disciples and the apostles hanging around him, they weren't the ones that got invited into, you know, the, the upper division classes. They weren't following the, the, you know, the known rabbis of that day. It was the Pharisees who had been trained. They were the ones that they, they had to memorize the Old Testament law. Hold to it. They were perfectionists. They were respected in that culture. And yet he says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. What will it take? And I like this about Jesus because he just tells you what you need to hear. I liked when I first studied the Bible. And I remember that verse that says, unless you hold to my teaching, you're not, you're not going to make it. If you hold to my teaching, you're really a disciple. So it's not just a lot of talk. There's actually action behind it. We get inspired by it. That inspired me. But he says here something that I think we all need to hear. Especially as I've talked to a number of you here who have been a part of the church for like 30 years. And if we've been in church for any length of time, we can fall into uh, a similar mindset of the Pharisees, a similar mindset of the teachers of the law. We've heard these verses before, Steve. I've read the Bible for many years. I know what it takes. And we can become perfectionist-minded or performance-minded or religious-minded. And he says you got to surpass that because he's talking about going beyond what you think in how to live a right life. And ultimately, the way to be righteous is not through perfectionism, is it? The way to be righteous is not by performance. Instead, what we learn is when you make an effort to be as perfect as you can be, follow the Bible as best you can, you realize you can't fully do it on your own. In fact, the more you want to be that way, the more it should humble you as you just get honest and talk straight to yourself and go, man, I mean, I've been a disciple for 31 years, but I still, I don't like, I don't want to sin, but I still see sin. I still get tempted. I'm still challenged. There's difficulties. And that's what humbles you, right? That's where righteousness comes from. We're going beyond performance-based righteousness, and that is what the message of the cross is all about, right? What Fadi talked about. God would, would go to the great lengths to save you. So he tells the truth, and it calls us higher. It calls us to go deeper, and it calls us to recognize that real righteousness will come from God forgiving us and from us giving ourselves up, recognizing we need this grace. It's a good message, right? Jesus' message is powerful. As he goes on in Matthew, you read all the commands where he goes through the Old Testament. And he says, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. You have heard that it was said, do not be angry. But I tell you, right? You have heard that it was said, but I tell you over and over, he talks straight to everybody. And yes, he's calling them much further than the Old Testament commands. He's calling to them to a life of total surrender of the heart and living by the Spirit. He talked straight. He told them the hard truths, knowing that that would ultimately lead them to the cross. How are you guys doing it at telling the hard truths? At looking at the hard truths in your own life, right? Jesus says, you've heard that it was said. Here's a really hard one. Do you remember, remember this one? Enter through the narrow gate. 
For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. That's a scary passage in our world. In American culture where, you know, about 70% claim to be Christians, although that statistic keeps going down. I don't know if you're aware of that. But in westernized culture, the even claiming to be a Christian is, is, is decreasing quite heavily. Uh, in the global south, it's growing. In, in Latin America, in Africa, it's growing. In western nations, western uh, Europe and America, let me tell you, they're sending missionaries to us. But we still have a large percentage that claim to be Christians. So this is still a very scary verse, right? Only a few find it. Only a few. I like that Jesus just lays it out, right? He's not sugarcoating things. He's helping us understand the truth so we can trust him. But one of the challenges oftentimes, like I said, is that we can spin it. We can put a little hot air in there. And, and not say as clearly as we need to. See, Jesus in verse 21, he just gets right to it. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who, see, who, who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons? And in your name perform miracles? Then I will tell them plainly. You guys see that? I will tell them plainly. I never knew you. Wow, away from me. So Jesus, he talks straight. And if you like honesty, you like it. Just tell me just like how's it going to be. Lay it out for me. I want to know how it's going to be. Don't spin the situation. So a situation occurred last year. Carrie had run into, we live in West LA and you know, it's, there's a lot of challenges there. I'm here to tell you, it's, it's glitz and glam. There's a lot of wealth. There's a lot, you know, movie, you run into, you see movie stars on a regular basis, but the homeless issue is just epidemic. It's terrible. Uh, there, there's all kinds of challenging situations. So she's out shopping at Trader Joe's. We had been having a, a little mentoring, discipling time with, the, with our teen, leading, teen couple. And I had to run off to another appointment. So she was just walking back to her car, which is at the Trader Joe's parking lot. And a guy that was homeless and maybe not in his right mind started following, started, you know, she told me about this later, started following her. And she could see, she's very intuitive, she could see there's something wrong with this guy. And there were lots of people around and normally she's very, you know, confident and she'll just back that person off. But she could tell, okay, there's something, this guy, I don't, I gotta, so she goes into Trader Joe's and grabs the manager. And it really scared her. She's like, this guy, and he was, he was looking at her through the, through the, the, the glass and they had to, you know, get the management there to get him, you know, to kind of back him off. And, and then eventually he disappeared. But it really shocked her and it was, it was disconcerting and made her feel really vulnerable. And it was a scary thing. Similarly, at that exact same time in life, she was going through a, a, a bout of shingles, which if you've had chicken pox that's in your blood system, you can get it. A lot of us get it, uh, can happen. And it was a minor bout and she was recovering from it. But all these things that happened, a couple days earlier, and, and the ring, I, I, I'm giving you an example of, of sort of my not talking straight in a situation, just to give you an example of what not to do, okay? I needed to talk to our elder, and uh, I was busy. I needed to have this phone call with him, but she and I were having a conversation. She was, you know, she's working some, some, through some things that, that wanted to talk to me about, and, and, uh, but I, I had been waiting to get a call back from her elder, and I hadn't talked to him yet about the things that had gone on in her life in the last couple of days and just hadn't had much of a conversation. But she was processing, and her, you know, the little ailment of shingles was, was improving. She'd gone to the doctor, but she really still felt some depth there. And so anyway, I hadn't talked to our elder, and he called and said, hey, how's Carrie doing? And I go, oh, she's great. <laughs> well, in my mind, I mean, we, you know, she's getting better and she's processing things. But I hadn't talked to him yet. And she's sitting in the same room with me. And I was like, I got to have this call. Oh, she's doing good. Let's move on to the stuff I want to talk to you about. <laughs> so later, Carrie's like, honey, you just, you, just, you just didn't get real with him about what's going on. And actually, she was in the room kind of looking at me like, are you serious? Get real about what, how we're doing, how we're feeling. You know, he wants to mentor and shepherd and guide and protect. He's, he's our partner. And him and his wife, they, they partner with the Shumps. So some of you might know the Shumps in, on the west side. They're our elder couple. And, you know, they, they need to know what's going on in our life. And so here I was wanting to get on to the other stuff and sort of spinning the situation. 
Or not laying out the hard thing of here's what she's going through, here's how she's been feeling, here's some issues that we're going through, here's the difficulty, the nuances. I was glazing over it. You guys with me? That did not build trust. I had to apologize. You know, I had to point blank just say, honey, I'm so sorry. You know, I, I hear it. I was spinning the situation. It's not okay. And she called me on it and I just apologized and we talked. But, but sometimes we do that with each other. And instead of building trust, we break down trust. That can happen in families, can happen in small groups, it can happen in whole congregations, can happen in your relationships. We got to tell the truth and talk straight. You guys with me? You want to build trust for great things to happen in the congregation, to great things to happen in your small ministry, great things to happen in your own household or in your family. You got to learn to talk straight. I was talking to the West Side Church, and there were a few things I just wanted to get clear on. I wanted to talk straight to them. One of the things I brought up was, you know, our campus ministry was flourishing. A lot of great things going on, lots of campus growing. But we have quite a few children of other disciples in our campus ministry. And although we're, we're seeing some great victory, a lot of people moving in, we're seeing some new people getting baptized, there's still some trust levels in that generation. They don't fully trust or understand even the big picture of the mission. And we just had to admit it. That was part of why we were doing the series. Some of their trust levels had been broken down by things they had seen, maybe by hypocrisy that they had seen. Maybe because they hadn't had a chance to understand the why behind everything we do as a church. They didn't see the why. They didn't see the years of blood, labor, money, sacrifice for why we give world missions and how it's changed so many lives. So they don't want to just be told. They want to understand the why. In the West Side, I know you're about to do your special missions. Last year, we hit our goal. It was awesome. We give to the Middle East. We give to Sweden and, and uh, the, the Nordics. We give a little bit to uh, the um, Central America, Mexico and Central America. We hit our goal. It was awesome. But when I looked at what had ha actually happened, only 50% of the members of our church had given. So we hit our goal because there's so many generous people. But I realized there's 50% that, that didn't give anything to world missions. I had to talk straight and go, that, that's not okay. We have to look at the reality. I could have been like, hey, we hit our goal. Let's move on. It's wonderful. But there were some issues right there. Right? We're, we're coming on our mission again. And we got to talk straight. Some people are hurting financially. I understand that. God never asks for more than we can give. Right? He's just asking for us to give our heart and the resources he provides and be sacrificial. But understand the why behind it. Another area I wanted to bring up in our church that I thought was really important is in, on the west side of L.A., 60% of households are single households. That's just who lives there. Singles, professional singles, there's not as many families. And we've had a lot of move-ins and move-outs. But here's the thing with singles. We, we've had some incredible weddings and fun things happening. I love seeing all the weddings we've had. We've had a lot of young married couples there. But, you know, we also have quite a few singles who have been disciples for over 20 years. And, and, and they would like to get married. And I just said, point, let's just be real. There's a lot of us here who are at a place where we have to face the music that we're mourning. Some of our ministry, we mourn. They're mourning that they've, they've aged to a place now where like, I may not be able to have children or, or, or fathers or, like, or men or like, I, I won't be able to father children or I, and that's not a reality now in, in our life. We have to talk straight. Our church is evolving and changing. We're getting older, right? We got to be honest with age. I'm, I'm, I'm getting older, right? I'm not as healthy as I'd like to be. Talking to Forrest, our bodies don't work as good as they used to. He's younger than me, but all our bodies can break down. We've got to tell the truth and face the music about the reality of life. And I wanted to tell our single sisters, listen, I feel your pain. I'm not glazing over it. I want you to know that's an issue. And, and God has a plan in that. God is good always. He is good at every age and every generation, every situation. But let's not act like it's not painful and heartbreaking. And it's a reality, guys, not just in the West Side. Our whole movement as a fellowship is evolving. And that's the reality. That's a reality. And can we, we need to look at it and go, can we do something more about it? Can we create a, a more encouraging environment? Yes. Can we teach deeper on how to minister people at those stages? Can we help people understand God's still using you? Maybe that dream is, has to be altered. I don't know all the answers. But I want to talk straight about it. It's there and it hurts. Amen. On the West Side, we had to talk about that. In the West Side, we're a really diverse church. 
And the, uh, the George Floyd murder a couple years ago uh, devastated our ministry. It hurt them deeply. The, of course, as a, as a nation and as a world, we went through a sort of an awakening of, wow, is there really some racial nuances and systemic issues that permeate our society? And, and, and you know, the reality is, yes, there are in 2020, 2021, 2022. There's racial problems. Not just in America, but there's sin. Greed permeates our world. You don't think it's filtered into racism? Of course it has. It's the reason that it exists. You look at the history of, of humanity, and it's still in our, yeah, are we an awesome country? Yes. Is there opportunity here? Yes. But let's just face the music. Racial injustice exists. It goes on, it's systemic, it permeates. Every time I do a Google search for pictures to put in my sermons, they're almost all white people that show up on my Google search. Every time, I'm like, what? I can give me some, I, you know, it's like, let's, let, what's going on here? There's little systemic, now that's changing, by the way. Google's working on that, right? They're, they're working on that. But to not admit the reality of things, for me, during that time, I had to admit I just wasn't sensitive to the pain of some of my people of color that were great friends of mine. I was not sensitive to some of the dilemmas and challenges and problems that you're facing that I'm not facing. I'm not going to stick my head in the sand and act like it's the same. I got out of almost every traffic ticket I got in. I'd just be really nice, say, hey, how you doing? And really sorry, sir. And I'd get out of it. A lot of my friends would not get out. In fact, they wouldn't drive in L.A. past 8 p.m. Hey, can you drive? Sure. I didn't even realize why they're asking me. We got to at least talk, talk the truth and realize things are not as perfect as we would like. And our culture is, is growing. I, I, see, I see evolution and growth in our church. But let's just be honest. We've got to go after injustice wherever we see it. And it exists. Amen? So we got to talk straight as a church. Warren Buffett, he said it takes 20 years to build a reputation and only five minutes to destroy it. It's easy to break it down, but you know you can also build it back up. There's a story about a woman who goes into a doctor and says, Doctor, I'm so mad at my husband. He has hurt me so bad. I wanna, I'm going to divorce him and I want it to really, really hurt he said, you want it to really hurt? Okay, don't file for divorce for the next six months. But I want you to be so nice to your husband, so kind and giving and loving to him. And then when you divorce him, man, it's going to tear him up. It's going to be the most painful thing you've ever faced. So she goes, oh, I like that plan. So then she began to be really nice to him and kind to him and loving towards him. Maybe her motives were off, but eventually the heart changed. After six months, she goes, you know, doctor, I don't feel the same way. I think our marriage is improving. I think we're going to stay married. I don't want to hurt them. Their trust improved, right? They treated each other right. Things can build. And she didn't follow through with that. Trust can be built. We got to talk straight to build that kind of trust. But I want to bring something else, a little caveat to this. You got to have balance when you talk straight. That doesn't mean you just blast every person you see. Hey, I don't like how messy you keep the kitchen, you know, every chance you see your roommate, right? Campus students or singles or whatever, or husbands and wife. We got to speak the truth in love. You speak the truth in love. And love is the truth. Sometimes it hurts like we saw from Jesus' own words. But we've got to have some balance, right? We got to have balance. We can't, you know, telling the truth also has to be combined with kindness. Kindness is also a fruit of the spirit. You got to have kindness. Now, my 12-year-old, okay, again, his filter's not so great, but, you know, he'll just point stuff out without really being kind. Hey, Dad, your belly's really big today. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. You know, it's like, hey, you're really wrinkly, Dad. It's true. Did you have to tell me right now, you know? <laughs> so you need balance in how you talk straight. Jesus had great balance. I love this verse. Come to me all you who are weary and burdened, 
and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, He's telling the truth, but it's a kind truth right there. It's an encouraging truth right there. And we have to have some balance in talking straight or else we cause more distrust. Talk straight, but use balance and wisdom when you do it. Use kindness when you do it. And so I have a challenge for us, church, as we close out. The challenge for you is to ask yourself, and I want you to ask and have a dialogue I have a challenge for you in two places this week. I want you to have a dialogue with somebody in your, either your household or your physical family. And I want you to talk to them about, is it hard for you to talk straight? You can tell them what you think and get their opinion on what they think for you. Do you or is it easy for you to do it? Why or why not? And the second place I want you to do it is within your local ministry. If you're in a small group, do it within your local ministry, all right? Ask somebody, not in your physical family or household, hey, is it hard? And you share from your own life. I want to talk to you about, I think it's hard for me to talk straight. Here's why I think. What do you think? Have the conversation. If we do that, we're going to build blocks toward great trust within our families, within our small group, and within our greater church. And when you do that, God's going to do amazing things. Talk straight. It will build trust and God will do miracles. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and go to God in prayer as we close out and we'll have a final song. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time to be with the Phoenix Church. Lord, we want to be like Jesus who was able to tell the truth, the hard truth in the right situations. Not paint a rosy picture. The, the picture isn't rosy. Help us to be humble and tell the truth about situations in our family, uh, situations in our ministry, but also to have the balance to tell kindness, to tell the blessings and, and the hope, to know that we got to surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees through deep surrender and going to the cross. Father, build great trust here in Phoenix and across all our fellowships. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.